So let me just provide kind of a few words of, um, of background and kind of context here. And the way I kind of like to think about this is to imagine a, th a thousand years ago, uh, in the year uh, 1013, imagine that if we take some of the documents that have come, been created by humanity over that last thousand years, and think about them. We have the documents themselves. We have some things that maybe some of the people that we know were responsible for those documents have written. We can kind of backtrack uh, and try to think about what they were thinking um, by reading other things that they wrote. Um, but we don't really have the footnotes. We don't have the first drafts. Uh, we don't have uh, the back and forth between the drafting committee of uh, how they arrived at the document uh, that they produced. Um, and. So in a sense, we've lost the conversations um, that went into making um, these things that we call our, our uh, documented history. Um, now we're making a lot of new documents, um, explode more than we had probably ever made per second um, you know, in history. But our ability to capture the conversations is still pretty crude. Um, we have some crude tools. We've got things like Google Docs and track changes and whatnot. We have some online tools, but they're pretty balkanized. Um, we don't really have any standards. Um, a lot of these are run by organizations that might not be here in 10 years. Uh, and so how do we try to solve this problem where in a thousand years from now, we might look back and actually have a record of the conversations that happen around the things that are really important to us. So the seed of this idea of how we might kind of do that, and the reason why we're here today, um, is frequently credited to this rather extraordinary guy, Vannevar Bush, um, who in 1945 wrote this uh, article, as we may think, in the Atlantic, in which he laid out this crazy idea for this machine he called a Memex, um, with glass plates and spinning wheels and motors and belts um, that was actually this thing which we call a web browser now today that doesn't have any of those internals but does have these cool glass plates and actually tabs that we can um, uh, go back and forth and now we've got uh, uh, touch screens. So we're actually starting to approximate this cool device that he thought of that in which we would have the ability to have access to all the world's knowledge. Um, and so he, you know, in a, over the course of four or five pages, um, took this to its natural conclusion and imagined um, what might happen, what might be possible in a world in which all knowledge was accessible by all people. And, you know, envisioned this class of trailblazers uh, who would, as a profession, um, connect the dots and connect information so that it could be reshared with other people. Uh, 50 years later, in 1993, um, Mark Andreessen actually tried to build this uh, into the first web browser, um, Mosaic. And he, in this uh, uh, blog post, announcing uh, Andreessen Horowitz's $15 million investment in this interesting company, which, are you guys here, Rap Genius? There he is right there. Um, uh, made a rather extraordinary statement, which I'll read because it's so cool. Back in 1993, when Eric Bina and I were first building Mosaic, it seemed obvious to us that users would want to annotate all text on the web. Our idea was that each web page would be a launch pad for insight and debate about its own contents. So we built a feature called Group Annotations right into the browser, and it worked great. All users could comment on any page and discussions quickly ensued. Unfortunately, our implementation at the time required a server to host all the annotations, and we didn't have the time to properly build that server, which would have obviously had to scale to enormous size. And so we dropped the entire feature. I often wonder how the internet would have turned out differently if users had been able to annotate everything, to add new layers of knowledge to all knowledge, and on and on ad infinitum. So, non sequitur, 3D printed. What, 
explains the popularity of 3D printing. What's so compelling about it? Maybe it's that it's revolutionized our ability to interact with the world of things. And we used to all be makers 100 years ago, a couple hundred years ago, and then the Industrial Revolution happened and that we stopped doing as much of that and stopped, started consuming things. So now maybe we have the interesting thing about 3D printing is our ability to kind of regain um, some of that capability. It's kind of changed the balance of power. So with 3D printing, we can make things, and we can do really interesting things like print connectors that let us attach Legos to Tinker Toys and bristle blocks and erector sets, like this thing, the free universal constructor construction kit, which kind of made the rounds last year, if you were paying attention. Um, so maybe that's really the interesting thing about annotation and the reason why we're here today is that annotation lets us break the paradigm of the web as constructed by other things and lets us be able to reach in and reshare and reconnect and become makers on the web uh, just like 3D printing. So that instead of the web that we have now where authors, uh, webmasters, publishers make pages and connect them one page to the top of another with hypertext links that in the future we as surfers or former surfers and now makers of the web can lay annotations on top of it and connect inside of things multiple times even in the same documents or to video or data or all kinds of other extraordinary kinds of information that we haven't thought of. There's maybe a danger if open annotation is a hammer, going back to Maslow, um, that we start to look at everything as a nail. So maybe another question is, what is annotation not? Um, and so maybe that's another question for us today. So this, the question is, is this T0, right? Is this the point at which the denizens of the future will look back and say, presto, annotation started happening 2013. Um, I don't know, but if it's gonna happen, then we need not to just build the technology and create the standards, um, but we actually have to get people annotating. We have to get a million kids using the universal construction kit to actually wire Legos to Tinker Toys and Bristle Blocks and Zoob, whatever Zoob is. Um, and so that's why we're here, uh, is to figure out, because we have this, the standard is good enough, right? Um, we could use that to start to create technology, and some of us here in this room have. We've got some early annotation technology, enough that we could probably start using it to make some real annotations. But what we need to do is try to figure out what real people, real communities need in order to actually use it to do useful things. Um, and that's why you guys are here, and thank you for coming. <laughs>